please welcome John Maida, the president of RISD. How is everybody here? Yeah, it's kind of tired by now when you want to eat something good, so. I know the feeling. I was just back there in the green room with uh, Amanda from Salam Garage. Very exciting, so let me just sort of prep that for you. Uh, but it isn't about Amanda right now, it's about myself. I'm sorry, excuse me. Hello, I'm John Maida, and I'm talking about um, some things I'm thinking about. And uh, it is 2009, we're in, uh, who's from the East Coast here? Who knows about snow, the real stuff? Very good, so uh, snowy place, uh, East Coast. Um, let's see here. So uh, I was just uh, in um, New York. Who knows LaGuardia Airport, the lovely airport? Yes, it's beautiful. Um, you know, I was walking off the airplane, Delta shuttle, and uh, you know, I, I, like all of you, don't eat very right. You know, we eat like vending machine food a lot, and so I, I did a double take. Every time I see the vending machine, I stop, you know, shop a little bit, you know. Uh, but at the LaGuardia uh, uh, Airport vending machine, I, I felt that whole Madoff moment, you know, where between the Milano cookies and the cookies, you can buy taxi receipts, a whole stack <laughs> for $1.50. <laughs> uh, I, I sense corruption, I sense micro corruption. Uh, so we still have a problem, America. Let's work on this. Um, a little depressing. Um, I like to talk about uh, some themes that I like to talk about, which are art, design, technology, and business, all kind of together, all mushed up in a nice gumbo. And um, uh, if some of you know what I've done in the past, I used to make flying things, like lots of flying things, flying visuals. Uh, uh, the work I've done, it's, it's on the web, or it's in the MoMA collection. Um, and uh, I got tired of visual stuff about a couple years ago. I began to make all kind of things. Uh, I had a show in London um, called uh, MySpace. Not that MySpace, but my own space, uh, my to MySpace. And uh, I made things out of iPods. So I made a, a fish out of iPod Nanos uh, uh, called Free Swim. And um, I also made different little sculptures out of different kinds of iPods. Uh, out of the larger iPods, I made a... Um, uh, a pair thing, you know, it's called, it's, it's called marriage. It's one iPod, like, nuzzled against the other one, like, you know, oh, you know. And uh, the uh, digital video is uh, two, hour, uh, two minutes and 30 seconds long, playing in a loop. And because the, this iPod is, um, has a hard disk in it, uh, when it sort of rewinds, it has a little, little nanosecond delay, and so the, the, the two movies begin to come out of sync, you know, like a real marriage, you know in sync, out of sync, and so these are things I've always been uh, playing with in my spare time at the time. Uh, I also uh, dabbled in different things. I designed shoes and apparel for Reebok. Um, I did a, a homepage uh, se section for Google, um, and I designed different um, gadgets in JavaScript. Um, I don't like JavaScript. I know you guys like it, but I don't like that. Um, and uh, I made a clock called the uh, Mida clock. It's the about clock. So it's about a quarter to 12 in the morning, or it's about three past five. So it's a very friendly, simple, inaccurate clock. Um, and uh, these things I used to make. Um, and uh, there was a, a moment uh, a few years ago where I felt stressed out about technology and began to focus on simplicity. I developed the laws of simplicity to help myself think about simplicity. And, um, from that, uh, I noticed the world has gotten a little seemingly simpler. Uh, who has this thing, the Jawbone 2? Who has one of these things? It looks really simple, right? Uh, it's a terrible device, hard to use. Uh, let me give the instructions. Uh, my favorite one, uh, press the talk button for two seconds. I can always get that one right. Uh, but it uses that modern semantics of like, um, uh, you can do this for two seconds. Or you can press this maybe like three times. Or you can press this uh, five times. And I, I, I only can do the two-second one. But uh, these simplified devices are uh, uh, conspicuously actually complex. And so uh, from this stress, I've been realizing how to simplify the idea of simplicity. And um, it's all about time. Because we all want to save time. I have eight minutes and 24 seconds. I have to end on time. And time is critical to everything. And uh, how do we deal with time in the modern-day world? Um, 
all of you are quite busy-ish people, and you all have the same problem I do. Like, what is the uh, cost of a first-class airmail air stamp? See, no one knows for sure. Uh, I wrote a little web app to, to pull the uh, US Postal Office to get me the answer. But even then, I, it breaks sometimes because they change the protocol. So uh, I just do this, like randomly <laughs> put values of postage, hoping they won't come back. Uh, but uh, luckily, they designed a product for me. Uh, maybe use it as well. The wonderful forever stamp. Oh, it feels so good, you know? <laughs> You never have to worry about your postage. So I, I love this design. It's a perfect example of simplicity uh, in design, the forever stamp. Um, I also collect signs of uh, fire escape signs uh, because we're running away from danger often. And um, uh, this is in uh, Chicago. Uh, you know, Chicagoans know to run away from fire. It's important. Uh, whereas I noticed in uh, Miami, uh, the sign looks like this. Like, uh, oh, I'm, I'm not worried at all. Uh, the fire won't catch me. The weather's outside. It's nice. Um, and I also noticed in um, Paris, they know how to book. <laughs> you know, they're running. Uh, and why is running important? Why is time important? It's because in the end, we're dealing with this question, am I in a hurry or... Uh, can I take the time to smell the roses? And so this is the complexity of dealing with simplicity. It depends how you feel, how rushed you are. And in this day and age, we're all very rushed. Uh, add to that the fact that technology makes things happen at light speed. Uh, problem, the problem is that uh, electrons travel at light speed. People don't. We're not that fast. Um, and so we have this sort of problem. We have all this possibility, and we have all these limitations of who we are as people. Good limitations, very human limitations. And so uh, what I've been curious about in the last five years is how technology was very important. The pendulum swung towards technology, and now I think it's swinging towards humanity. We're recouping in a way. That's why social media is so meaningful today. We want to be people again, human again. It's a wonderful problem to have, you know? And it's a great time to live in, I believe. And uh, last year, I made a switch in my life. Um, I was at the MIT Media Lab, uh, technology, and moved to RISD, kind of humanity. And uh, uh, some of you may know that uh, I, when I wrote the Simplicity book, I discovered the letters MIT in perfect sequence in Simplicity. So I had that M. Night Shyamalan moment where I could never leave this place because MIT was written in my cards. Um, but I discovered in the word, uh, French word raison d'etre. RISD, get that? So the spell was broken, so I was allowed to leave. And I went to RISD, and uh, RISD is a place of maximum creativity. All of our alums do wonderful things. Many of you know Shepard Ferry's Obama poster, Gus Van Sant's milk, uh, milk movie. People who just make amazing things are pumped out of RISD every day. And RISD is a traditional art and design school doing everything the way that things have always been done for hundreds of years. And it's at RISD that I'm discovering how RISD people think. First of all, RISD people love to get dirty. I mean, not that kind of dirty, but dirty. Like hands are dirty, pants dirty, faces dirty. If you walk around in Providence and someone's like dirty, RISD, you know, like that. Um, so not afraid to get their hands dirty. Uh, secondly, RISD is all about reality. Like anywhere you walk on campus, it's got to be real. We have a facility called Nature Lab, featured in this month's ID Magazine, where you can like check out a coyote, or a turkey, or a lizard vertebrae. You just walk up and say, can I have a, a frog foot? Oh yeah, here we go. <laughs> and you take it back to your dorm room and sketch it. So it's kind of like a living Google, basically, uh, a place where you want to touch it instead of just see an image. It's all about reality. Um, also, RISD people are not afraid of danger. Like, uh, I know in this industry, if you like, the code breaks, and not that bad, right? Um, in RISD, everything is like hot and toxic, so if your hand melts, it really melted. So big problem, uh, but it's all about reality. The, the, the being alive is a key factor to a RISD education. Uh, add to that, RISD is very personal. You know, I think that every student um, uh, has these one-on-one -on -one critiques with their professor. One-on-one, -on -one, it's amazing and where they work out their personal ideas, their passion, and so it's all about individuality and a spirit of community that is quite amazing in this day and age. Uh, also, I see art everywhere at RISD. 
Like, I was walking around in the morning, like around 6 a.m., and around campus and the dormitories, and uh, there was this strange paper mache creature on the ground. It looks like a, with a weed attached for its head, and it looks like a Poland Springs ad, but it's not. It's just on the ground, and I was like, what is this? You know, and I, and I just see this art everywhere. These, these elf-like things happen all over campus, which I'm very proud to be a part of, to feel human again. And also, I see people sleeping a lot, uh, not because they're lazy, but because RISD is all about working extremely hard. Uh, uh, RISD, they say, stands for reason I'm sleep deprived, uh, because these kids work extremely hard, and it's all about that Yankee gumption of make stuff no matter what. And uh, you know, we're, we're, all, we're all in the media a lot this year. Maybe you've seen us in USA Today, ID, BBC, New York Times, because I'm talking about RISD as this place which is very strange. It's, a, it's kind of an uh, anachronism. It's a, it's, it's a representation of early American creativity. And now, more than ever, I believe it can stand for American innovation in this day and, and age. And uh, I recently was asked by students, actually, when I was coming into RISD and interviewed by students, uh, they said to me, if this is one of the most creative schools on Earth, why is the administration not creative at all? You know, so I was the incoming president. I said, oh, that's really good. So let me try and fix that, folks. So what I began to do at RISD is just experiment. Um, I, like our people here, I opened a blog. I had a blog on campus, and uh, my blog is kind of a, a, a different because um, what happens is um, uh, all the faculty, student, and staff of RISD can all speak with me 24-7. Uh, kind of awkward on Tuesdays, which is Anonymous Day. Um, a little bit tricky that day. Um, and, uh, and with this kind of mechanism, what I believe is we're able to erode this idea of leadership in the 20th century, where um, if you think of leadership in the 20th century, it's about maintaining the hierarchy, this idea that somehow, uh, based upon the railroad system, the idea that you can't talk to me unless you talk through the chain of command, you know, kind of an army metaphor as well. Um, I believe that um, in this century more than ever, uh, this organization thing is all messed up. You guys all represent this new thing, right? This weirdness where suddenly you can talk to anybody now. Like one of my vice president's sons just fronted me on Facebook. That's pretty strange, but it's all possible. And I just love this point. This point is that the organization is morphing uh, in this idea of leadership to one where the tree is becoming this network that we all know about from the information technology field. And the challenge doesn't become about the individuals, the nodes, but it's how the different nodes are attenuated, which is very exciting. Now, I found that at RISD, uh, in doing these kind of things, uh, using this kind of model of leadership, I've been trying to break things up. Um, I have a blog where everyone can talk with me. Uh, excuse me, next, next step, next one. Uh, where basically I find rumors around campus and post them. And, uh, uh, it's quite fun, actually. Uh, rumor, this rumor happened. And so I say, well, this rumor happened, but it's not true. Thank you. Go back to work. And also, because of Anonymous Day, it gets quite dicey. I remember when I first became president, um, the negative factions came on the web and said, uh, you're president, no one will ever tell you the truth. The truth is out there. It's on the streets. So I wrote back, dear Anonymous 245, uh, I was just on the street eating my lunch. Uh, secondly, uh, what is the truth? And so I find this is a wonderful way to talk with the campus at RISD. Secondly, we have, uh, and the community, so with this blog, I found it's no longer in my blog, it's the community's blog. Secondly, uh, Anonymous Day is respectfully self managed. Thirdly, uh, there are confu there's confusion with respect to who makes decisions. Is it John's decision? Is it our decision? So that's a little bit weird. Uh, fourthly, I become the moderator forum versus the CEO, which is quite Awkward, but interesting. Um, and lastly, people who say, I will never visit the blog, their feelings are changing. Now, what is happening with this system, that's one system, we also have a social media canvas. We have screens all across campus where anyone can post images or text uh, for free. And this is uh, done through mobile phones, through the web. And so this is all freely accessible to all students at any time of the day. And this is another experiment uh, at RISD. I'm over time right now. Let me see, one moment. Screen, screen, key points. Uh, anyone can use it. Number two, it is uh, used by our staff a lot. Number three, 
Uh, faculty are sort of using it, students much more. Number four, students are virally accepting the screen. Number five, and it's also a screensaver. So any screen on campus become, can become this display system. Now, I'm closing now. Um, so I'm grappling with this idea of creative leadership right now. So if there is creative writing, what is creative leading? And this idea that somehow you have to lead authoritatively versus creatively is the question I'm trying to ask in a way. If you think about it, all of us as leaders have to lead authoritatively in some cases, but we want to be creative somehow. We want to be free, spirited in some way. And if you think about someone who leads authoritatively as a creative, that's Steve Jobs. If you think of someone who leads creatively as an authoritative, that's how Barack Obama feels to many. And so these kind of leaders are what all of you are becoming naturally for society. And I have a, a chart like this. So on the one hand, you have traditional leaders and creative leaders. A traditional leader is, wants to be a symbol of authority. A creative leader is a symbol of inspiration. It's a little different model. A traditional leader is all about yes or no. They have to be very clear. A creative leader is about maybe, very comfortable ambiguity. A traditional leader is concerned with being right. A creative leader is concerned with being real. And because I want to make sure I end on time, I have to be real and tell you that all this data is available on the web. Type in creative leadership. It's all up there. And thank you for your attention. And keep on leading, folks. Bye-bye.